Today we're going to be talking about whether content or data is the primary driver of the monetization of online video, the use of first party or third party data targeting capabilities is playing a bigger role in the online advertising space. At the same time, more and more companies are investing significant budgets to create high-end original online content. The panel today is going to explore these two trends, which some people could say to some extent are contradictory trends, uh, with a focus on sort of the present day circumstances and what we see developing in the future. Um, we have a great panel here today. It really cuts across premium content producers, aggregators and operators of content platforms and an operator of a video exchange and ad serving platform. So let's just start with a brief 30 second intro from everyone. Sure. Um, Sharon Silverstein, I uh, run West Coast Digital Sales for MTV Networks or Viacom Media Networks now. Um, and that's all about eight properties across music and uh, mail entertainment. Uh, Bernard Ho, I'm the general manager of video at IGN Entertainment, which is a division of News Corporation. We're a males 18 to 34 uh, centric network. Our flagship site is IGN.com, which focuses on video game news reviews, such as um, content like that. Uh, Rich Kennedy, I run business development for Blip TV. Uh, Blip is a platform for uh, original web series creators, so we provide um, distribution, analytics, and monetization for original web series creators. My name is Teg Greninger. I'm Vice President of Product at Adapt TV. Adapt TV is a video uh, advertising platform, so an ad serving platform uh, that also provides the Adapt TV marketplace, which is an exchange for online video advertising. All right, so let's jump right into talking about premium content. We hear a lot of premium content um, and a focus on premium content and online video, and that's where a lot of the monetization is occurring. So my, my first question is, what is premium online content? Sharon, since you're from MTV, we'll start with you. Sure, I mean, um, for us, it's, it's definitely our shows and our musical performances. Um, for Comedy Central, for MTV, those shows that are on right now, Jersey Shore, I'm sure you guys have all heard of it, are doing great, um, and so that is definitely considered premium content. I think, I personally think everything that we put out there is, is premium content, because we really try to super serve our audience and our targets, and speak to them in their languages, so, so I think premium content is. Uh, my take on it is that, you know, if you look at a very general um, definition of it, it's, you know, high quality content, um, where you know the producer and you know the track record of that producer and you know where that content is going to live and you can expect it to be there and you know the brand advertiser wants their name next to that content. Oh, and for, for us it's um, you know we, we recognize that there's a lot of professionally produced content and, and Blip is more of a, a, a tiered producer program where we have sort of a farm league that leads to um, a more premium league and, and we have shows that are, you know, like we've worked with Talking Orange who has about 50 million views a month um, and a lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's not premium, but it's, it's aggregating, you know, 50 million views um, and it's, it's someone who's doing something episodic and programmed and uh, in our eyes, that's, that's a premium show. I think there are a couple of definitions depending on what you want. Um, I think that uh, so it's for some brand campaigns, so we're thinking about this in terms of advertisers and what advertisers want. Um, they uh, are really looking for an association between their brand and the content they're sponsoring. So um, obviously, you know, sponsorships go back a long way and, you know, back to the days of, you know, 1950s, uh, you know, soap operas and, 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 uh, and sponsored programs. Um, and I think that's one notion of, of, of premium content is the, is the content you want to put a sponsorship on. You want your brand, the brand you're marketing to be associated with. Um, I think on another level, it has to do with um, uh, predictability uh, and safety. Um, so specifically in the, uh, in the digital video world, I think um, we have a huge diversity of what kind of content is available for advertisers to put their advertisements in. And I think um, that um, advertisers, you know, big brand advertisers, uh, often don't want that kind of diversity. They actually want something that is more predictable and safer for them. 
And so knowing that the content is happening on a particular site, in the case of some of the Ambulance properties, for example, um, or that the content is coming from a particular uh, producer, it's been made for television or professionally produced in some way or produced by some, some uh, entity that they understand, I think is, a, is sort of a proxy for them for this sort of a safe environment. And both are valuable, but they're both very different things. So sometimes you really want that sponsorship and sometimes you're just looking for safety. Do, do you guys view it as, is it, <coughs> Is it clear cut? Is there are there two categories of content? Is there premium content and everything else? Is there anything in between? You know, an episode of the Jersey Shore being streamed online and UGC footage of a adorable cat in someone's living room. I mean, do you guys see a middle ground there where it might not be the most premium content, but it's monetizable and it's of a higher quality than sort of a pure UGC content play where? I think most people are seeing difficulty in monetizing right now. I totally view it as a continuum. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll have other opinions, so I want to hear them, but you know, we see it all at Adapt TV, so, um, so I, I definitely view it as a continuum, and, and different advertisers like different kinds of content. And if you're an advertiser that really only wants to be on the you know, broadcaster sites, um, there's, it's A, expensive, and B, there's a limited supply of that inventory. Like, you're just going to be, uh, you're going to have a hard time, in some cases, hitting your your um, your budget goals or your impression goals or your uh, sort of reach goals. Um, and so, most campaigns are, you know, that we see have multiple components. They'll be spending some of their money on, um, you know, super high end stuff where they're going to have a really great association, um, and then they're going to spend a lot of their money on a broad swath of, you know, very nice professionally produced content that may be uh, made for the internet or it may be curated in some way. Um, like some of the content you'll see on some of the uh, sites like eHow or, or, or um, you know, sites that are quasi semi-professional or something, where the it's totally safe environment for them and the right audience, but it's not necessarily made for TV, and that has value too. Uh, it may be lower value, but uh, there's definitely a price and, and a lot of campaigns that want it. All right, let's jump into how you guys are packaging and selling your existing inventory. Um, are, are you guys, all, well, how many people on the panel are selling using any sort of first party or third party data targeting? You guys are doing some of that for video? <laughs> Nothing? Oh, we do tons of I know that you guys are. <laughs> so at MTV, you're generally just selling, you're selling broadly. Are you leading with the premium content pitch? Um, I think it's. Definitely a sponsorship and a premium content pitch. Uh, you know, when you have these temples, you just have people who want to be surrounded by them. So for us, we focus on our temples, on our premium content. And, you know, I think when people come to buy MTV or Comedy Central, they know the target. You know, they know it's a clear 18 to 34 target for males for Comedy Central. And so we feel like we already have that target there that we don't need to go, go deep or further and sort of use data to, to really target them in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, a, it's all about kind of having a consistent level of quality across our network. Um, and if you want the additional targeting on top of that, um, and it's usually not demo for us, it's usually more product specific, like on our main channel, iGen. You know, if you are um, an Xbox advertiser and you only want Xbox consumers, you can pay additional uh, an additional premium to target just that audience. Um, but for the most part, our, con our audience is so concentrated in Mails 1834 that you're hitting that demo with whatever content you're getting on our network. Yeah, we, we, I think we use, we use targeting occasionally. It's, it's specific to the campaign and the objectives of the advertiser. So actually, a good Xbox example is EA wanted to reach um, Xbox owners and um, people who were signed up with accounts. Uh, so we did an integration with Blue Kai. We were able to actually find out who the owners were and give them a demo that they could actually just click on the ad and when they got home later, the demo downloaded and they could try it out. And th those work very well. So, I mean, it sounds like you're all talking about hitting, generally contextually targeting it to somebody who, just by the nature of the video they watch, you have an idea of, of an intent there or an interest or, or demo targeting. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's pretty common a, a, across the industry. If that's the case, I mean, 
do you, do you think it's really the content that's leading the buy, or do you think it's the audience and the content just needs to be over a certain threshold? Like, do you think advertisers are saying, I want to be associated with this content and that's the primary driver in their buy? Or do you think they're saying, I want to hit IGN's audience, or I want to hit an 18 to 34 year old male audience that's interested in video games, and I just want to make sure I'm in front of content that won't embarrass our brand? Rich, my view is uh, that almost, that most campaigns are not true sponsorship campaigns. That most campaigns are campaigns that are trying to achieve awareness. At the end of the day, brand campaigns this is awareness for a particular product so that the next time the consumer is sitting in the supermarket aisle and they've got 25 brands of paper towels in front of them, they reach out and they pick Bounty. Why do they pick Bounty? Because of the years and years of dollars that were spent on helping them you know, understand the value of that brand. And if your goal is to try to do that, then you want to reach as many people as possible and you want to reach them in decent context. You don't want to reach them when you're annoying them or in, in sort of unsafe or you know, unsavory context. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to hit your audience and you want to hit them sort of, hit as many of them as you can, have a, a high effective TRP essentially. And I think that, um, that, that when you know what your audience is, in the case of paper towels, I presume it's the person in the household who's responsible for buying consumer packaged goods, um, typically the mom and so on. Um, and that's, that's, that's what the RFP says on it. Um, and one good way to try to hit that group um, is to, uh, to use, you know, to, to, to target programming that is attractive to that kind of audience. Another way to do it is to use sort of cookie-based uh, data. Um, and, but the liability of cookie-based data, it's a great promise, it sounds wonderful to just hit the women of the household with cookie-based data. The liability, as I'm, I'm sure everyone here on this panel knows, um, is that the coverage of these cookie data sources is just so low that um, you're not gonna be able to get the broad reach brand awareness that you're looking for if that's the way you choose to go. So typically you're using content topics or whatever you want to call it as a proxy for audience so you can go out and hit it. And Ted, what, could you give a rough estimate of the percentage of impressions running through your exchange where there actually is cookie level data targeting associated with the campaign and is it something that you see increasing recently? It's, yeah, we actually, so little shameless plug, we did the, release the Adapt TV Digiday State of the Video Industry uh, report today, and uh, um, you can download it from our website. We actually asked those kinds of questions, um, and we actually showed a little bit of data from Adapt TV in our marketplace as well, uh, in addition to survey data. And people, um, in Adapt TV, cookie targeting has gone way up, so almost everything is user data targeted in somewhere, not everything, but a, a very large fraction, more than 50%, I think it's between 50 and 75%, I'm not sure. Exactly. Um, that's the number of campaigns that have some targeting associated with them. Typically, the number of impressions that are actually delivered using the targeted portion of the campaign is much smaller, and the reason being the, the coverage gap that we just talked about. It's and, a huge trend, though. And, and the coverage gap is just an issue of there being a scarcity of video inventory overall? No, it's an issue of the fact that we collect data from users in very... Um, that it's hard to collect good demographic data from users and it's hard to use it for advertising um, because of users' privacy concerns generally, right? I think there are some providers on the web who know all of our age and gender perfectly. Uh, Facebook comes to mind, uh, Google probably another one. Um, but generally they can't or won't use that data for the purpose of targeting. So what we have to do is make do with registration data that comes from merchants and so on. And just the number of people in which we have that kind of demographic registration data And what, what's everyone's point of view if, right now, I think, is everyone in a, do you guys see a current challenge now to being able to monetize UGC content? Right, I know you guys aren't running it, but do you think there's a market right now to be able to run branded CPM pre-rolls in front of UGC content? You know, us at IGM, we've actually um, made a conscious decision not to run UGC. And in the instances that we have, you know, on occasion, running, you know, large kind of user submission um, contests and things like that. We'll just not run ads on them. Um, I think it goes back to just the brand safety issue. I think that, you know, where IGN is a, you know, kind of plays in the ad market is that we offer a, a high level of just quality across the board so that the advertiser kind of knows what they're buying into. And when there's anything such as UGC, we'll just not run ads on it just to be safe. 
same goes for us. I mean, we, we don't run any UGC. I mean, our, our you know, target comes to us because they want quality content and they want to see what MTV is doing because it's cool. So they typically, it's not something that we do. When we've done UGC, it's just, it hasn't been successful. So we've, we've made the decision not to do it as well. Yeah, we don't really, I mean, our, our shows, so people upload shows to our site and we have a, a content team that curates the channel and curates a lot of that programming and also gives quality ratings to things. So we typically have a cutoff for quality and um, you know, there's, there's a, a small bucket of things that are, they're not really user gen, but they're things we wouldn't advertise here. Right, but I, I think Blip is a good example though, right? Because you guys are, you're playing in a, fairly wide spectrum, right? You have some really, really professionally produced content and you have some stuff that's more, it, it's, I would call it grittier, but really good content, some of it has a big following. Yeah. Are you guys packaging your audience as a way to sell across that content? I mean, I, I think that you guys are doing an amazing job of selling into kind of YouTube all-star type content and really interesting content, but it's not content that you're gonna find on TV. And how are you going out and pitching that? Is, is it your... We, we position it, I think, with, we, the sales team goes out and really presents it as a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid, they give professional content and Hulu has the, the primary, um, you know, top tier with Blip and original web series sitting in the middle and then user gen sitting at the bottom. So we really talk about having a well-lit, safe environment for advertisers while at the same time having some more experimental, cutting-edge content that wasn't produced by a Hollywood studio. And Ted, are you seeing like with the emergence of being able to do data targeting, I know it's early days, but are you seeing any impact on publishers who are playing more in the UGC space or less traditional professional content? Do you see it as a way for them to increase the value of their content, uh, the, con the value of their inventory by being able to say, hey, you know, this stuff might not be on TV, but look at our reach in 12 to 24 and or behavioral targeted info that makes it more valuable to advertisers? So I'll start by saying I don't think any advertiser, or very few, not any brand advertiser, wants to be in objectionable content, right? There's no, uh, you know, and, and being in an environment where you can't control that means it's just totally unacceptable. I think you're not gonna get started with a brand advertiser. <coughs> that said, because as I said before, I think there's sort of, there is sort of a gray area, and I think, um, you know, there are a number of sites um, that have, for example, some user submitted stuff that's curated, for example. Um, and they, they, it's part of their own business and their business processes, their business rules to make sure that they're displaying content that has been reviewed by, uh, completely reviewed by their own team first. Um, and to me, yes, that's user generated officially by the official title, but um, it's perfectly brand safe. Um, it may not be an awesome opportunity for some sort of big sponsorship because it's not branded content in some way. Um, but, uh, or it's not, it's not premium per se, um, but it is safe and it is acceptable for brand advertisers and there are, depends on the advertiser. There are advertisers who spend a lot of money, by the way, uh, and for example, Rekha Tenkaiser comes to mind, who would like to buy video ads um, at a relatively inexpensive rate, um, but have high reach and they're less sensitive about exactly what content they're in. Um, that they're just one example, but they're famous for doing it, I think in the industry and there are many others. I think uh, a number of the, brands that are targeted more at uh, young uh, teenage demographics, for example, um, uh, you know, are, are like Axe Body Spray, you know, comes to mind, are very happy to be in a wider range of content. It doesn't have to be um, TV quality, you know, professionally produced. It just has to hit the right audience. Uh, so it depends on the brand. Um, and I, I think there is a price for, except for content that's completely unmoderated and you know, risky, I think there's a price for, for all the other grades of content. Um, and you'd be surprised, actually, folks with good, moderated, user-submitted content, uh, I think can command very decent CPMs and have a good business. It's, I'm sure the CPMs are still a fraction of what you make at MTV, but it uh, doesn't mean it's not a good business. What, what's a, what's ballpark of a decent CPM? Okay, so actually, we do have a slide on this, and I would normally never pull anything out, but because we surveyed people and it has nothing to do with me, it's just the survey results, um, we actually saw four, for, I forget exactly, so you guys have to go pull up the slide, I, I apologize, but um, uh, the, the low end, if sort of the bottom tier of content, so sort of pure UGC, I think, I don't know what we called it, but the lowest end content um, was typically zero to $5 CPM. 
the middle grade content, which included like semi-professional or like small clips of professionally produced content or whatever, uh, was I think um, the CPMs ranged in the, they were in the 10 to $20 range. And I don't remember, you can go look more specifically at what the results were. And um, for sort of TV quality or professionally you know, produced premium content, um, the CPMs were uh, obviously north of 20 bucks, so 20 to 30 dollars. Um, those were just averages, and they were stated by respondents in the industry. Um, both publishers and brands got to comment on what they actually thought the CPMs were, and this is what they said. All right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, we're talking about exchanges. Um, I want to talk a little about video ad networks. So over the last few years, we've seen the emergence of few really big video ad networks, a lot of players in the space. Um, interestingly, most of, the, most of the video ad networks are totally new startups. They didn't rise from existing display networks. Um, and if, if, if you go and look in Comscore at the top 10 streams of ad views, it's dominated by networks. You have, a few, you have the Adapt Exchange, you have the Bright Roll Exchange. Um, I, I think CBS and Hulu are the only, you know, media companies in there and everyone else is an ad exchange um, or an ad network. What, what do you guys, and it, so if premium content is really leading the pitch, how, how do you explain the success of the video ad networks out there now that are, are driving so many of the advertising streams? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, I really believe that there's two, two big pieces to a plan and it's definitely the ad networks for the reach, and it's definitely the premium content for the, the brand awareness and becoming a part of the conversation. Um, you know, MTV networks just across our music entertainment properties has over 140 million Facebook fans that we program to. So it's not just our core sites, but we reach a mass audience who's really engaged. So I, I do believe that there's there's room for both, um, but they just they they solve different problems. And they're not in competition either, right? I yeah. mean, we work with all the ad networks. Um, we definitely rely on them, and they provide a valuable piece of the ecosystem to us to, you know, provide liquidity when we are unable to, you know, fill um, our own inventory ourselves. I mean, with um, YouTube, uh, you know, IGN has launched its own kind of YouTube channels, and we've become, you know, quite big on YouTube. With that um, large amount of inventory, we really are reliant on ad networks to help us fill that. Yeah, same here. I mean, we, we generally sell, you know, especially Q4, most of what's available to us that we consider premium inventory. When we don't, we backfill it, and uh, we don't view it as competition. We're happy to take the money. And do you guys worry at all about um, ad networks driving down CPMs, or do you view it as there's a recognition that if an advertiser wants to really be guaranteed that they're on your site and know where they're going, they need to buy direct from you, and a network is is not going to deliver them that same sort of that same sort of guarantee. Yeah, I mean, definitely for us. And uh, on the exchange, what, would you share what what percentage of uh, streams being bought are being bought from a from networks instead of being bought directly from agencies? Right, so we have two sides of our business, the sell side and the buy side. So on the sell side of the business, um, the streams all come directly from publishers. Right. We don't work together with aggregators because it is not safe enough. Like We don't know where the inventory is coming from. On the buy side of our business, uh, we do serve um, everyone who buys media. So we do serve uh, agencies and brands directly. Um, this is a significant uh, chunk of our business. It's, uh, I don't know, roughly half or something. Um, we also do work with uh, trading agency trading desks. We work with DSPs and we work with ad networks. So basically anyone's welcome to buy on an exchange, right? That's the thing about an exchange, it's totally open. Um, and um, I don't think I can share um, specific numbers, but the, the, I can tell you that the, uh, the early on in the exchange's history, networks were the primary buyers. And I think that's actually true of the history of display exchanges as well. And the, and the reason being, that those are the guys um, that uh, are already aggregating inventory together. They already have demand that they've already gone and sold, and they're scrambling at times to figure out how to deliver it on the sell side of their businesses. So they're uh, going and looking for excess inventory, and exchange is a very convenient place to go find it. Um, so that was an immediate source of uh, demand for uh, the 
adapt TV exchange or the adapt TV marketplace as it started. Um, later, uh, sort of the evolution has been, I think, that agencies are getting more comfortable with the notion of exchanges and what they provide, um, and they're also getting more sophisticated in their ability to use programmatic buying, buying tools, like to, to work with DSPs, for example, to be able to bid on exchanges um, in, a, in, a, um, in a programmatic uh, way. It requires a bit of sophistication. So as agencies, I think, ha have been getting more sophisticated, they've uh, been uh, buying more of the adapt TV marketplace, and it's been an increasing uh, share of our revenue. Um, so, Sharon and Bernard, you both started talking a little bit about distribution and syndication. Um, I'm interested to talk about that a little bit. So, I, I think all three of you I know are doing a good amount of distribution of your video content to different places. Uh, the first thing I'd be interested to know is, I mean, I, I, I think in general when you're distributing video content, there's a few, the value proposition can be any of a few things, right? I think it can be a revenue opportunity. It can be a marketing opportunity to get your brand out there. You can do some distribution where you're getting direct traffic. Um, I'm interested to know what, what's your core goal, and maybe there's more than one, but what's really driving your distribution strategy? What are you looking to get out of it, out of those three things, or maybe other, uh, other value you get out of it as well? Uh, for us at IGN, I mean, it's, it's probably the first two things, probably you know, the marketing and the monetization. I think that you know, we've come to the realization that you know, we, we need to take our content to where the audience is. And you know, there's very little cannibalization uh, by doing that. And so you know, we've done deals with you know, Five Men, we've done you know, YouTube, Xbox Live, and we've taken our content and just you know, repurposed it. And the syndication game has really worked out for us. Um, and you know, in the beginning, you know, several years ago, there wasn't that much money in it for us. But as those audiences have grown, and as uh, those platforms have grown in monetization, it's really paid off. Yeah, I mean, I would say the same. The other, the other place that we really use is social. I mean, we program for social, and that's how we syndicate a lot of our content. But that's also how our users syndicate content for us. So it's, it's really more of a viral thing, um, rather than just going out and, and purchasing it. That's, that's been really, really successful for us. And are you selling into those streams? So if, if when you have users sharing videos on Facebook or other, you know, through other social sharing and, and the video is not living on your site um, and it's not necessarily living in YouTube, well, YouTube's a bad example for you guys, but it's not living, you know, on a syndication partner site, it's just out there and viral. Are you serving ads into those streams? Um, in some places, but for, for us, it's sponsorships and creating custom content mm -hmm. for an advertiser around a cultural moment like the VMAs. You know, if, if Lady Gaga is eating a taco on stage and we syndicate that across our Facebook pages, that's great for Taco Bell and their sponsor. But so part of your sales pitch is, you know, we have this can live within our sites, we might have some partners that can live on, but also this is going to go viral, this is going to be social, and your brand's going to be associated with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that works really well for studios as well. I work a lot of entertainment business out here, of course, and you know they're coming to us to syndicate a trailer launch, right? And they they can't get enough of that social audience because the response when you put a trailer on there that's exclusive to our networks and is, is great for that audience. It's just incredible. And, and oh, sorry, go ahead. And we're selling directly into um, our syndication partners as well. I mean, we're so consistently sold out on our owned and operated properties that we're really fortunate to have partners um, you know, such as YouTube, such as Five Men that have allowed us to sell into that inventory. And as long as the, um, the audiences and the views are there um, in kind of a critical mass, then it is a, pretty, um, it, it is a pretty easy thing for us to sell into. And how are you, when you guys are selling your syndicated video views, are you generally able to sell it as one package with one CPM? Or are you is it is it tiered, or are you sometimes getting a higher, more premium CPM on your own sites, and, and a, a different different deal when you're syndicating out to other sites? Yeah, I mean we have we have tiers. It just really depends on what what the client's looking for. I think that um, it goes back to the question of you know does the client need to know where the where the content is being run because 
um, at least when they buy with us, they know what the content is all about. They, they know that there's that consistency there. But as you go to broader and broader syndication, um, we have some partners that you're not quite sure where you know, that exact content is gonna show up. And that's where I think the CPMs get diluted a little bit. And what do you guys see, just one last question about syndication, are you, so you're going out and you have your content, it's the same content that's gonna live on other sites. Are advertisers asking a lot of questions about the demographic makeup of sites that you're syndicating to, or are they looking at it and more that they wanna be associated with the content and trusting that more on a contextual basis that the audience for your videos on other sites is gonna be similar enough to the audience on your own site that they're, they're comfortable with the buy? Yeah, for us, we, you know, we focus on the demo of our own and operating sites and then YouTube because it's such a significant part of the overall picture. And those audiences, um, luckily for us, are, are extremely similar and have very little overlap. So it is really a reach play for us. And um, you know, that's probably as far as the conversation goes. It, you know, we're, we're just so concentrated in this one demo that um, our, our advertisers tend to get what they need. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I think everyone's talking about you need more inventory. You know, you're generally you're selling out the inventory. There's a scarcity of inventory for for uh, <clears throat> for good video content. Um, so, if you look at the market, the market is continues to grow at a really significant rate. So, I, I have some numbers from eMarketer. So, 2010, the online video ad spend was 1.4 billion. Uh, 2011, 2.2 .2 billion. Next year, it's supposed to grow to 3.1 billion, uh, up to 7.1 billion in 2015. So b basically, over the next three years, the ad spend is, should increase about 250% according to current estimates. We're hearing that it, it, it's not a situation where there's a significant amount of premium inventory that's available now. So my question is, where are these dollars gonna go? Are CPMs gonna triple? Is the amount of inventory gonna, <clears throat> gonna increase by 250%? Are we gonna find a way to make some inventory that we can't monetize now monetizable? Where, where's it gonna go? It's all gonna be spent on exchanges. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think CPMs, CPMs are actually on a, it, from what I can see, it's sort of a, a gradual up, uphill trend. Uh, I don't see, and we keep hearing that at some point CPMs are gonna drop because they're still irrationally high relative to broadcast and so on. I don't see that happening, but it may happen in the future, but um, I also don't see them tripling. Uh, it's hard to imagine. Because um, at the end of the day, CPM is determined by what's the value to the brand, right, to the advertiser. Um, in terms of what, uh, I do think that brands are going to continue to grow more comfortable with a variety of content. It's obviously, um, I, th I think there's I th always, I think there's always a special place for premium content, no question. And I think that more and more of the dollars will be happy. For example, with YouTube. So when when you look at the comp score today, and you look at where all the viewing is happening, and I think this panel is very acutely aware. I don't know if you guys are. Um, about half of all video viewing in the U.S. happens on YouTube. Like, I think there's, I don't know, some like numbers are like yeah, a couple so points it, out of date, but it's like. It's 35, you generally see about 35 to 40 million US content views a month. 30 billion, 35 billion. Right, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. It's like Dr. Evil. One million dollars. Yeah. Uh, 35 billion to 40 billion, not million. And it's about, I think it's about 18 billion yep. are on YouTube. Sounds right. So it's about half on YouTube, and then there's everything else, right? And that everything else includes uh, MTV, includes IGN, includes Blip, includes all the sites inside Adapt TV, and so on. So um, one elephant in the room, and I don't have a pr prediction for it per se, is you know that that YouTube is sitting there largely unmonetized. I know they do sell you know ads on their impressions, but it's very low ad load at the moment. Um, we think of it as a giant undifferentiated mass of UGC, not the case, right? I mean, here we have Bernard telling me that huge amount of his traffic on IGN, like, you know, professionally produced content is on YouTube. Bernard is not alone, right? That's, that's the case for many of the TV broadcasters and other sort of, you know, made for internet. There's whole networks that have launched and run on YouTube. I mean, we all know about next new networks, but, you know, they're not the only ones. There's several of them. 
So there's tons of good brand safe content sitting there, um, largely unmonetized with very low ad load. One thing that's gonna happen is a lot of that's gonna get pulled up in ads. And the prices for those ads, which are right now very, very low, you can buy some of that inventory on, on Google's ad exchange, Hello World ad exchange. Um, but you know, mo many people aren't. They actually supply is way out of whack with demand there. So if demand comes up, actually, um, you know, I think that could account for it right there. What, what, what are the rest of you think? What I think, you know, it, a lot of the, um, it, it's the different, you have to look at the different creatives, right? So pre-roll is in high demand and it's very sold out, but there's other units that are, I think when you're talking about unmonetized stuff on YouTube, it's not, you know, given their frequency caps and everything else, pre-rolls are actually pretty sold relative to their delivery rules. It's overlays and other display type units that you're not, um, you're not seeing filled. And what we're looking at a lot is, is what are the units that engage consumers? And, and they're possibly there are better units for a better user experience that keep people viewing videos longer without throwing free rolls in front of them every time they show up. Maybe they come, become more of a fanatic of a show, maybe they spend more time viewing online video, and then you can sort of work them into tolerating more ads because they're in love with the content or because they want to be in front of something specific. And I think, you know, I think I agree with Tag that you know, YouTube takes a big share of that lift. I think that, um, you know, exchanges really help facilitate the liquidity, but I, I, from what I've seen, at least, when it comes to IGN, is that our inventory clears at a fairly low um, rate, and I, I see that coming up as well. I think the last piece of where that lift is gonna come from is probably international. Um, you know, we've got localized sales teams in the UK and, and Australia, but there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of ground out there that we haven't covered yet. And a lot of that inventory, especially on YouTube, um, doesn't get sold through, and you know that could be where some of that um, some of that growth is. Don't forget, don't, don't forget the uh, increase of viewership too. I mean, I, I don't know what those numbers are, but you know, my guess is that online video viewing could easily double in that time period that you're talking about. Um, you know, if today's teenagers, you know, become adults. And you know, the, the next group of teenagers does the same thing. Well, there you've sort of doubled it too. Like how many YouTube videos does your average teenager consume in a day? It's, it's a very large number. I, mean, I think it's platforms. So mobile, iPad, I, I see a lot of dollars shifting there. Mm -hmm. um, I read some stat that, you know, in 2015, more mobile phones will enter the web than, you know, people going on the internet through their computers. So. I mean, we have to be where the audience is, and, and I believe it's it's mostly on your platforms. Understood. All right, I think we're we're we have a, about ten minutes left, so we're going to start taking any questions from the audience. Hi there. Uh, you guys mentioned YouTube. Does it freak you out that uh, they're starting to charge based on views and allow users to skip on ads? I mean, if you think of like Google's dominance in search with AdSense and AdWords, it's because they allow people to pay per click, so they siphon a lot of money. I know it's a different kind of advertiser, I get that. But I mean, MTV, I know you guys are not on YouTube, IGN, et cetera, et cetera. You can't possibly be happy about that because generally speaking, users don't like ads. So, you know, like, what are your thoughts on that, basically? Well, for us, the content that we put out there is exclusive to our properties, so that's the only place they can get it. Great point, but still the impact on overall CPMs, if an advertiser can get, you guys have great brands, you guys have great products, but if an advertiser can reach, let's say, instead of MTV, Vivo, or even instead of IGN, like Machinima, et cetera, like, isn't that a big threat that Google's gonna basically pummel the CPM model away into a CPV model, et cetera, et cetera, and bring down potentially the revenue you guys could make? I don't think so because it's, for us, it's programming of cultural moments. You're not gonna get a cultural moment off a video on YouTube. I mean, you know, music videos from Vivo, they're a commodity at this point, um, and they're great. I think they definitely belong somewhere in the plan, but for us, we still have such unique, exclusive content, and we are, you know, we, we create the stories, and that's, that's sort of the only place you can get it is within our sites and our social platforms. So, I guess no. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll just say one, one thing about that model is I'm, I don't know exactly what YouTube's model is, but there's a lot of models out there now where it's, it's cost per completed ad, 
and you're giving the user the ability to skip through it, but you're not charging them the same CPM for that completed ad as you would. Um, and a lot of it, frankly, is publishers or networks doing a backwards calculation of what their completion rate is, and then you can you know, pitch it to an advertiser, which is, is fair, is you're only gonna pay for someone watching your entire advertisement. I, I, I don't think we're gonna switch, you know, I don't think we're seeing a shift of switching to a model of you're paying the same CPM, but only getting paid for a completed view where the person doesn't skip instead of initiation. I also think that that's when you start putting, you know, is, is content, you know, king. That's when you start putting it to the test, right? I think that, you know, me at IGN kind of, I'm not on the sales side, so, you know, my sales folks will have a completely different um, answer probably. But, you know, for me, you know, I'm seeing extremely high pre-roll complete rates across our network. Um, 88%, 90% compared to industry averages of 50%. So, you know, if if it kind of moves in that direction, I think that, you know, speaking selfishly, I think that we're in a pretty good uh, position. I think that, you know, if that's an indication of is content king, I think that that's where um, the premium content providers might actually come out ahead. And also, it's nice to see that the panel for All Night has been in complete agreement that their own businesses are completely awesome, I think. <laughs> No arguments on that. I think that's been nice. So, Rich, let me say one more thing in response to this question. I think it's a great question. Um, I, and I would put to you this. Uh, Google has publicly announced, right, that they've taken this TrueView model and they've, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but they've ramped it hugely in the last year, or even six months. Um, and my question to you is this. Would they be r ramping it massively if it didn't, you know, increase their revenue per uh, video viewing session or per video view? In other words, yes, they may only be charging on a smaller set of the events, the ones where the user didn't skip, but my guess is that they're charging more than enough to compensate for that so that at the end of the day, it makes more money. We don't know. They kind of have the market share thing locked up right now. It's a yeah, no, no. So, it's good. So, so Google can always play that game. Right? They can always uh, choose. They have a lot of capital. They can always choose to uh, try to... Uh, you know, be anti-competitive if they want to. But I don't, I'm not, I don't think that's what's going on here. I think it's probably actually something advertisers really love and want and want to buy this way, and they're probably willing to pay for it. And if it turns out to be a really dominant, successful pricing strategy, um, you know, I for one have no problem with it. I, any pricing strategy that works and helps increase revenue overall for my organization, I'm happy with. Um, and if it creates a better user experience at the same time, great. And I think, you know, Google's trying to reach market equilibrium, right? I mean, they, they want the, you know, kind of, highest engagement, you know, content to kind of win out. They also want the highest or best targeted ad to win out at the end of the day, right? So if you've got the right ad for the right customer um, or the right viewer at that time, you know, they're actually going to watch the whole ad and they won't skip it. And I think that that's some of the, some of the testing that YouTube has done um, has borne that out. And the person who actually, the people who actually do skip the ads and don't want to watch them actually engage with the ad more than if they were going to let it go by anyway. <laughs> so. You're actually, you know, getting them more engaged and remembering your brand. <laughs> Maybe not in the most positive light, but you know. Yeah, um, we had uh, many thousands of items on uh, YouTube. <coughs> we were seen by close to a billion people, but we took off most of the content because we found out that um, uh, they pay very low rates, ridiculously low rates. And actually, uh, the content gets cheap and gets very cheap when it's on YouTube because nobody wants to syndicate the content from us saying it's available for free on YouTube. Uh, also, content owners t thought that their content is shown for free because they couldn't figure out that it's actually monetized. So, uh, just want to get your thoughts about that. So, uh, I'm sorry, is the question, uh, if you're distributing your, your content to YouTube, does that create a roadblock to being able to distribute your content to other publishers because they can just easily go to YouTube and embed those videos? Well, the question is, uh, don't you think that you cheapen your product by putting it on YouTube as much as it's got all these views, you get very little money for, uh, for the ads? Sharon, do you want to answer that question? <laughs> well, so, I, I think uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, we, we've found the opposite to be true. I think that, you know, like I was saying before, you know, we found that we have 
a very, you know, almost identical demographic audience mix on YouTube, but it's different than what we've found on our own and operated. Um, you know, we're 100% ad supported anyways on our own and operated, and we're able to s sustain those CPMs um, across into YouTube. So we found it to be pretty successful. I mean, we're not trying to license our content to anyone um, for a fee anyways. So everything that we, we do is pretty much ad supported. And so that model fits pretty well. Yeah, YouTube's a great um, place to, if you actually come across a show there, there's opportunities to engage with that user and get them interested in your programming and, and potentially window off of YouTube where, you know, it's not a zero sum game where they're either watching off YouTube or on your site. You can actually extend your audience, extend your reach and get people who are, who are truly interested in coming back and looking at more of your shows and, and potentially going off YouTube and looking at your sites as well. If there's more information there, something else to see. Time for one last question. Any, any last question? All right. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.